just hope that Mr. Potter will always be around to save the day. Welcome to the Drag Malfoy podcast, made by the fans, for the fans. Where we talk about fan films, fictions, and theories. My name is Ivy. And my name is Baron LeVay. And we are the Drag Malfoys. So, you've tuned in to uh, Drag Malfoy podcast. The very first one. The very first one. Lucky you. (laughs) Oh, unfortunate, however you want to look at it. Yes, that as well. (laughs) Um, as a warning, that we are drinking and we will continue drinking during every yeah. episode. <laughs> we will. So I am Baron LeVay. I'm, I'm a drag king from Newcastle with a penchant for nerdiness and cosplay. And sitting <laughs> on video call with me because we've chosen the perfect time to do this during a lockdown is Ivy. Yeah, hi. <laughs> we decided during lockdown that it would be a perfect time to do a duo thing in almost every aspect of the sense. So, yeah, I'm Ivy. Uh, I am a drag queen in Newcastle. Um, me and Baron know each other personally. <laughs> you sounded really weird when you said that. I know. <laughs> we know each other on a personal level. <laughs> So, yes, we are the Drag Malfoys on on the TikToks. We are both Slytherins. Yes, we are. What's your Patronus, Ivy? My Patronus is a a Westie. That's really cute. (laughs) It's it's so little. I remember getting it on on Pottermore and I was like, really? I mean, they're very loyal. Very, it's true. That is true. Yeah. What about yours? Um, Mine is a buzzard. Is that... Is that, is that a bird? Yeah, it's like a, a bird of prey. Okay. For some reason, whenever you say buzzard, it reminds us of um, a duck. A duck. <laughs> it's a little bit like a vulture, I think. Oh. So it's not a pleasant animal. <laughs> it's severely wrong, but that's okay. So we are... Um, th- this is the Drag Malfoy podcast, as I've already said. Um, it is... By fans, for the fans. So we're going to look at fan films, fan fictions and fan theories. In all their glory. (laughs) We say glory. That fan fiction that we read today started off really well and then it just kind of went... (laughs) I didn't hate it. It wasn't the worst thing I've ever written and it was very sweet for a very long time. But we'll get on to that one. Yes, we will. Because obviously we are the Drag Malfoys, so we're better place, uh, what a better place to start than with the Blacks and the Malfoys. So that's what we're going to discuss today. So Ivy, yeah. tell us about the film that we watched the other day. Uh, so we watched The Sisters of House Black. I remember being on Twitter when, so actively on Twitter, when they were fundraising for the film. Oh, wow. That had like little perks for everything. But I think at the time I didn't have any money to donate, so I didn't do it. But I remember it didn't, like, that kind of just got pushed off because obviously fan films, it would probably take a while to crowdfund for it. So when I first saw that it had actually been made, I was like, click, 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 like two years ago. But I've rewatched it the other day because we were going to talk about it. Well, I've stayed away from fan films um, because I'm a little bit older than you. Growing up, fan films were always terrible. Um, So I was like, I don't really want to waste my time and effort on them. But it turns out that things get a little better as you get older and like (laughs) technology changes. People get a little bit more skilled in in what they're doing, even as, as young fans. So... I think um, I was pleasantly surprised. Yeah, uh, when I first watched it, I was like, oh, this is actually really good for a fan film. Because, like, you had expected to see, like, mediocre acting and really badly shot bit of background noise, but it was actually really, really well done. Yeah, I, I don't know much about the um, the people who created it, but I hope that's what they're doing now, because... It was really well done, really well directed, really well edited, really well acted. It was, yeah. Well, actually, did you know, so the the girl who plays Bellatrix, 
Um, I don't know if you saw this meme going around um, a couple of years back. She's actually the dancing Hermione. Oh, wow. That's really cool. I did not know that. Yeah, I only found out, like, last year and I was shook as As in, as in the, 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 the Hermione that vogues? Yes. I follow her on the TikToks and everything. Yeah, that's her, Kelsey. <laughs> Oh, I was not aware of that. That's really fun. Yeah, I w- and she, obviously she created it, played Bellatrix very well, I might add. Very, very well. And yeah, I, I was also very impressed by the CGI. Mm, definitely. For a fan film, absolutely. I want to know what programme they used. Yes, that too. <laughs> I think we, we chose a good one to start with. So shall we discuss it at length? We both took notes. Yes. Yes, we did. I've got my book right here. Mm. So, so we start on the 31st of October 1981, which I'm sure um, anyone listening will understand the, the word. <laughs> it was the night that yeah. Voldemort killed yeah. the Potters, yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> I don't know why there was a word in my head and it just didn't happen. Event? No, I'm sure all of our listeners will understand the importance of that date, is what I was going to say. (laughs) There we go. Got there in the end. We're keeping that in because I'm old and I'm forgetful. (laughs) So we we start with shots of the family tree, the black family tree, um, and we see uh, a pensive. And it's all very dark and atmospheric. Yes, it only took me until the second time around watching it that I realised that the entire film was memories. Mm. I think it took me until the end to realise that, because I was like, are we going backwards and forwards in time? <laughs> but yeah, I was really, really fascinated by that different take on it. Because mm-hmm. I remember when I first watched it, I was like, these scenes are really short. And then I was like, oh, wait... Memories. Memories. So we see um, the the Black Sisters um, having an altercation at Hogwarts um, and then all three of them get involved and then there's a big explosion because, you know, their bond is really powerful. Yep. I, I explained that in the most wonderful way. Spoilers, by the way, guys. Spoilers. Spoilers. This does happen in the first, like, two seconds, though, so... Yeah, you know. I'm going to continue to spoil it, though. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> we see the first glimpse of um, Rodolphus as well. We do, and Lucius. And Lucius, who... Obviously, Lucius is prominent in the films, in, in the actual Harry Potter films, but Rodolphus, not so much. Maybe, like, he was a, a, a featured extra. It's nice to see secondary characters taking a, a more vital role in something. And I say that as a secondary character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think my character's more tertiary than... Uh, Uh, So, Wahlberger stops... No, not Wahlberger. Druella. Druella. I've written Wahlberger, but I knew it was Druella. Stops Cygnus obliviating Bella. Yes, I am fully here for that fan theory. Yes, I think it's it's definitely an explanation as to why she would be as batshit crazy as she is. Yes, like repeatedly having our memories taken away from her mm. and then but the genius I, I, I like how Cygnus didn't think for a second that Bellatrix would go and look in a pensive and uh, retrieve the memories back you know absolutely but she's a Slytherin exactly exactly cunning and he says you you will marry first and you will leave this house yeah I've had I've wrote that I've wrote um, pressurised to marry young yeah, it's a very big thing in pure blood families. Then we get the our family is the most noble house of black, which of course is a is a wonderful sound that goes around TikTok all of the time. It does, it does. I nearly use it. So then we have the sisters um, playing in the forest, mm-hmm. um, and they think the ministry has traced Bella trying to cast the Avada Kedavra curse and there's a whole big thing the trees are rumbling and it's all scary and then it's Ted Tonks it's Ted Tonks couldn't be any less scary <laughs> a little Hufflepuff seventh yeah muggle born 
who thought... So, so this is what I don't understand. He thought it was a good idea to go to this noble purebloods home <laughs> or ground. Yes. <laughs> where it is known that they don't like <laughs> Muggleborns and be like, oh, I've got a, uh, a show tonight if you want to come. <laughs> yes. Take me, gig flyer. <laughs> but then we see, obviously, Andy is very interested. She's like, oh. Hi. <laughs> She's flicking her bob, like. She's like, yeah. <laughs> I'll come to your short heads. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, he invites them to see a band at, at the um, at the pub. Yeah, and I think we find out later on in the film that Andy actually goes. Yes, yes, we do. Spoilers. Spoilers. Drink every time we see a spoiler. <laughs> so. Next, we see Rodolphus taking the sisters to see the Dark Lord. Rodolphus argues their case because Bellatrix is an aura in training and a dueling champion. Which goes on to this, uh, which causes a, a big duel because Voldemort, the Dark Lord, sorry, is, um, prove yourself. Absolutely. Um, so he challenges Bella to a duel. Um... And it's going very well for both of them at different points. And then he binds her and tells her to free herself without her wand. And she's like, oh, but I can't do it without my wand. <laughs> <laughs> but then he points the wand to his wand to Narcissa. Yes. As a threat. Um, and she she works out how to do her wandless magic and, and free herself. Yeah. And I feel like it it isn't really noted. I mean, it, it has been mentioned in previously that she's a very powerful witch but we don't really see it until that moment happens and you're like oh one less magic yes bitch <laughs> yes queen <laughs> and what i've written underneath here is that the visuals that the, the actress who was playing bellatrix gives are very helena bottom carter in the films like it's so spot on it's incredible. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that could be, like, Helena's daughter. Absolutely. It was absolutely incredible to watch. It was just like watching her. It was. And, like, and you, as the film goes on, you can see her unravelling into this insane character. Like, a lot of people, myself included, always thought that Bellatrix was always a little bit insane. And then yeah. went to Azkaban and 14 years in isolation just enhance that completely i mean i'm feeling it yeah <laughs> isolation <laughs> does that to a person so then we go two years later and bellatrix is still struggling with avada kedavra she can do a wondrous magic but she cannot do an Av uh, avada kedavra yet uh-huh yeah that's that's is a i can understand why if, if the situation is that you've got to mean it yeah she hasn't had a case of meaning it yet like she hasn't hated something so much in her entire life yes and then i've written cygnus obliviates her again clearly starting to lose it that's what i've written and i'm not <laughs> sure <laughs> that's a very, very good note <laughs> and then i've written death eaters appear lovely uh, so my note after the duel was the music box moment yes i've written that as, as well actually which is a very, very sweet moment. Do you want to talk about the music box? Yeah, I do, because it's cute. So Lucius gives um, Narcissa a music box, which is charmed to play when it senses love. Oh. Ah, Mr. Death Eater has a heart, as Andromeda <laughs> said. Um, but it started to play as Andromeda and Narcissa were getting ready for Bellatrix's wedding. Yes, yes, it did, and it was very sweet. But we know for sure that Lucis has, um, so Lucis and Narcissa's love is probably, I, I believe that it was probably one of the strongest in the fandom anyway. I agree as well. And I might have to, to, to remind everyone that everything that we say in this, in this podcast is our own opinions and no one else's. Because we're going to have some arguments here. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want another TikTok argument where it's like, 
but he is married to her sister. Do duet. <laughs> so we meet Sirius. So gay. So, so gay. So gay. That's, that's what I've written as well. I've written in brackets, gay. <laughs> I wrote Sirius equals very gay. <laughs> But we knew that anyway. Yeah, 100%. And you see also Wahlberger, so Sirius's mother, come over to Sirius at the wedding and be like, I want you to meet this person. And Sirius is like, or oh, flamboyant with his long hair, like, no. But with a mother as flamboyant as that as well, it's difficult to imagine anyone being anything but camp. That is true. That is very true. <laughs> so he's got the... Um... The Marauder's Map. He has. And Bella suggests a concealment charm. So it's in, it's, that's an interesting little theory there that Bella suggested that. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I don't think we know that, do we? No. No, we don't. No. And then Andromeda's arrested at the wedding. It's also revealed that Andromeda's letters, she's been concealing her letters. Yes. And she says it's because she works at the ministry, but it's obviously not. No, we know, we know why. Come on, girl. So obviously we're going backwards and forwards in time here, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so Sissy and Andromeda have been given details to Sirius um, because they had offered the House of Black to the Death Eaters. So they were having their meetings at the House of Black. So... Andromeda admits to Bella that she'd told Sirius and it's a big, big argument. One of many. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But, like, at this point, when it's revealed that the, the attack was intervened, then Bella is very angry. Like, to the point where yeah. you think she's going to hurt one of our own sisters. Yes. And she is, of course, becoming more and more unhinged by the day. So it's very believable that she could, at this point, hurt one of her own sisters. Yeah, even though we see in the um, franchise, at least, that Bella and Sissy do have this little connection. That they do somewhat love each other, in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think Bellatrix is, is difficult. <laughs> I think difficult would be the word. Difficult yeah. might be an understatement, but... <laughs> <laughs> and I think um, Narcissa is just happy that she's still got a sister. Yes, yes. Um, I think that the whole, the way the film made it so that her hair was half dark, half white to prove that she was in the middle of the two sisters was a bit like too literal for me almost and i don't think that it was as quite so black and white as that if pardon the pun because <laughs> um, <laughs> we see in the film when it is revealed that andromeda um has been having a relationship with ted that narcissa has got the same mindset as bellatrix that blood purity is the most important thing when Absolutely. it comes to carrying on the line. So I think she she definitely did love her sister and she definitely misses her and stuff, but I do believe that she did make the wrong choice in who she chose to spend the rest of her life with. Andromeda or Narcissa? Uh, so Narcissa believed Andromeda. Oh, right, okay. I thought you were saying that you believed. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, I think, yeah, I, I think I agree with that. I think at the end of the day, she was a black who married a Malfoy. Of course, she had that, that state of mind. Like, she, she, she's not as innocent as the, as the redemption arc made out towards the end. Yes, definitely. And I, I think she was very lucky to fall in love with a Malfoy. Absolutely. Um, we don't know what would have happened if she fell in love with someone who was of less, oh, less, I say in, in quotation marks, um, as pure as she was. But I believe that she would have carried on with the pure bloodline because 
She was brought up that way, even though Andy kind of went her own way. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. So Bella threatens Tonks and Andromeda. And Andromeda reveals that they were engaged. Big yeah. drama. Big drama. She has the ring on a necklace. It's all very, all very uh, dramatic. Absolutely. Bella Crucio's Ted. And there's yeah. a duel. Um, and I just need to add in there that the, the choreography of that duel was absolutely phenomenal. The cinematography in this film, like how they I know, filmed right? it, shakes me to the core. Because I, I am a big cinematography person. Like, So whenever I do see something that's absolutely breathtaking or really, really well done in film, I'm like, well done. You deserve, yeah. You deserve all the awards. Oscars. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> but we also have to mention here that Bellatrix casts the killing curse for the first time successfully. She does. She does. She masters the Avada Kedavra on a plant. <laughs> <laughs> Just spat my drink there. Uh, yes, she does. I, I think she wanted to warn. So this is where I think the love for our sister comes in. Absolutely. Because if, if she didn't have that love for her sister, then she would have killed Ted. Yes. Without agreed. a second thought. But she didn't. She chose to point it at a plant. Yes, absolutely. And I think there, there's a really wonderful moment um, where Bella's injured and she licks the blood off her arm, and it is absolutely f like it's incredible to watch. And she just she licks it and she she laughs and she goes pure. Yes, it was just absolutely perfect. Whoever wrote that moment was just like. As twisted as we are and wonderful. That's that's an un, another level. Like, I wouldn't have thought of that. <laughs> then there's some more dueling between uh, Bellatrix and Andromeda. And then there's a moment where all three sisters join their magic together again as uh, Narcissa tries to break up the fight and there's another explosion. And Andromeda tells Bellatrix to take her to Cygnus because she, she wants to be banished at this point. Yeah, I have a... Um, it written down actually here that Andy physically can't live without that love even if it's betraying our family to do so. Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. Like I think I wrote down all three of them have love affect them in different ways. Yes, I agree with that as well. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so yeah. they're all capable of feeling love. But obviously, it's it's said. I think Andy says it earlier in the film with the with the no. It's Narcissa who says it earlier in the film with um, the moment of the music box moment where Narcissa's like, "Oh, we're all so different in our own ways, aren't we?" Yes, yes, that was a lovely moment. It was. It was really nice, and I, I really enjoyed that. And it kind of, as the film goes on, it kind of brings you to realise that oh, they act they actually are like whether it be loving because I think. Bella's version of love is more of an infatuation. Yeah, infatuation, obsession, maybe. <laughs> yeah, very big obsession. Then we discover that Narcissa was keeping memories of Andromeda secretly. Yes, yes we do. And this is where we see that, again, Bella has that love for her sisters because she was going to destroy it. Mm-hmm. Until Sissy begged her not to. Yeah. And I don't know if there was anything in between those bits, but then I've written, Dark Lord is gone. <laughs> <laughs> Dark Lord is gone. Bella has memories of the long bottoms. Music box plays. That's what I've got written for the end. He's dead. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So the Dark Lord is gone. Bella, I, I vaguely remember Bella coming back, finding um, Narcissa with her memories of Andromeda. Yeah. And then there's some sort of scuffle, Bella drops some bottles, um, and one of them has got Alice Longbottom's name on it, which suggests to me that it was a memory of Alice Longbottom's death. Ah, uh, I missed that. Mm, I went back and, and paused it so I could read them. There was only one that I could actually read, but it was Alice Longbottom. That's interesting, because that could also be 
if if we're thinking about stuff that goes past the film, that could be something that would be used against her. Absolutely, evidence, absolutely. In, in trial, because we we know that she did go to Azkaban for not only for everything else that she's done, but it was it, it she was caught after just after the long bombs. Yes, absolutely. So I think that's clearly what they were hinting at, which was nice. And then music box plays. So I'm assuming that was a. I can't believe you've done this, but I still love you because you're my sister. I fuck off with your memories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I put it a little bit nicer. <laughs> I was like, it, it's, it is a nice moment to end on because obviously it shows there's still love between the two sisters there, even though there might be some resentment at the same time. Absolutely. I think I've written underneath all of that um, the underlying theme of this film is the political prowess within the black house Mm -hmm. um and it's all about political power yes yes i feel like that's a big theme around the blacks anyway and the malfoys and oh especially the malfoys um the fan fiction that we're about to talk about as well seems a little bit less so on the malfoy side like i mean they are like this the malfoys seem a little bit less strict than the blacks do yeah i'm going to talk about that anyway but yeah I'm not sure I agree. I, yeah, I was reading it and I liked the idea of Lucius's mother being... Yes. ...a bit more sensitive. Because that would explain where Lucius gets his air about him from. Yeah, exactly. And his, I think his father was the one to be very, 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 very harsh. Very harsh. (laughs) Very harsh. And I just don't... it, I don't know. I, I did enjoy the fan fiction, but I haven't read it all. Spoilers, I didn't read it all. So, folks, the fan fiction that we are discussing right now is Hey Soul Sister by The Slytherin Rose on fanfiction.net. Should we actually mention now that we are going to be linking um, the, the fan fiction and the film in the description below? I don't know why I'm making the motions because they can't see us. But um, I think you just did. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We're going to link them below so you can go and check it out and you can go and watch the film as well without having to search for it. Yes. Please do it. Please do it because you'll enjoy it. It is a very cute story. It is. It is. I've written cute, T rated, and 117,000 words. It's a very long fan fiction. It's 53 chapters. So this for me isn't a long one, but like for a day, for a day's work, it's it's quite long. It's a lot yeah, for a day. Yeah, yeah. If I hadn't have taken a break out of reading yesterday, and I would have filmed. I would have finished it by now. But um, I decided to do something else. Anyway, <laughs> so this fan fiction follows the trope of um, something appearing on someone's body when they've met their soulmate. Which, which is a very common trope. However, this is the first one that I'd read that the the thing that appeared on the body was the image of the other's Patronus, which I thought was quite a nice creative little moment. Which is very adorable, but it also creates the heart. I mean, the saddening moments that what if someone can't create, can't cast a Patronus? Well, there is that as well, isn't there? Although it does help that the, the the marks end up in the same place. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, first of all, we're going to discuss the fact that both Lucius and Narcissa in this story are able to cast Patronuses. So we know nothing about Patronuses in the Malfoy world at all. I do not, no, because I, I don't think... Well, there's a fan theory that Drago could cast a Patronus but couldn't after the war. Yes, I've read that fan theory. Um, there is nothing to say anywhere in in the franchise or on Pottermore that Lucius or Narcissa had a Patronus, which would make sense because they were dark. However, this leads to the question, does fate know that they're going to end up dark and they just aren't able to cast a Patronus from the beginning? Or do they lose the ability to? 
Because it is an interesting one, because in the story, Nessa is treated very, very badly by her parents. Mm -hmm. And you would think something like that would enable someone to cast a Patronus, because obviously cause for a Patronus, you have to have very happy memories. But then again, Harry could cast one. Yes. Plot holes with JK in it. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, it's not a very happy memory, but I think it'll work. Boom, it works. Wow. Shock. <laughs> so, Lucius's Patronus in this book is a lion. So I did some research because I was a bit like, a lion? Really? Yeah, because obviously Slytherin. Yeah. So I did some research and I found the, um, the personal attributes of someone who um, would be represented by a lion which would include nobility, which works. Yep, yep, definitely. Calmness, again, kind of works. In a way. Yeah. In a, I'm going to wear my mask, so I'm going to yeah. pretend that I'm calm. Strength and command. Earlier That's books, cool. maybe. <laughs> Later books, not so much. Also, if you look at the way that we play Lucy yeah, and Sister, no. definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> so then it goes in, and lions respect strength in others and have no time for subtlety. Okay. So I kind of okay. see that and I kind of don't. But then the final thing is that they don't follow social etiquette. And that is the big clincher for me because... What is a yeah. Malfoy without social etiquette? And Lucius is all about his image. Absolutely. So then, of course, we go on to the, the other lovely trope that um, Patronuses, if you, are, uh, uh, if you are a soulmate, match. So Narcissus Patronus was a lioness to match Lucius's lion. Yeah. Didn't their friends, the ones that, so their friends had him. Um, two of them had found out that they were soulmates, but their patronuses didn't match. One was a fox, and one was something else. Oh yes, I vaguely remember that. Yes, I wasn't that much interested in the friends, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but lioness kind of again kind of works for Narcissa, kind of doesn't. So we've got uh, lionesses are generally the child carers, which is. One, yeah, okay, definitely. And often mother other animals, for example, in um, in captivity. Sometimes lionesses have been known to mother other animals like monkeys okay. who are without mothers. So that, I feel, works quite nicely for the Harry moment in I the was end. Gonna, yeah, I was going to say it works well for the, the moment where she protects Harry in order to find her own son. Yes. Uh, stealthy predators... Interesting. She, I mean, she defied the Dark Lord. Mm, quite well, in fact. To the point where she managed to... Because you would think the Dark Lord would try and penetrate her mind to see if she was lying. Yeah. However, will allow their young cubs to be killed by budding alphas. So that doesn't work. I, yeah, I definitely don't agree. Um, when not around lions for a time, they will take the alpha role, even growing a mane like a lion. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I quite liked that as well. That could work for, like, example, if Lucius was... When in Lucius Azkaban. was in Azkaban. Absolutely. But also with Nississa, let's just say this now, Nississa was 100% the daddy in that relationship. Oh, 100%. 100%. If anyone's listening to this who hasn't seen our TikToks, check out hashtag drag Malfoy um, and you will see exactly what we mean by that. <laughs> um, so the fan theories about um, Patronuses. Yeah, I've got one written down. So um, there's fan theories that the, um, Lucy, that Narcissa, I've read one fan fiction that Narcissa's Patronus was a peacock. Mm -hmm. But I've also read that in general Lucius's Patronus was a peacock. So I have, I have this lovely little theory that um, that Lucius Patronus is a peacock, and at one point he could cast a Patronus, 
but when he joined the Death Eaters, he couldn't anymore. And that's why he ended up with albino peacocks on his land. Is that a thing? That is a thing that he wants peacocks, right? Oh, no, absolutely, yeah. Why did that end up with them having albino peacocks? Because he missed his Patronus? Yeah, so he could, like, remind himself of that, of, like, <laughs> that's why he had one. Like, that's what he had, and then that he did actually used to be able to cast a Patronus. Well, the generally understood fan theory about Lucius um, Peacock Patronus is that when... I can't remember, is it is it Severus comes into the Malfoy land and that's where it's written that there's a peacock, an albino peacock. And I think the general um, fan theory is that was actually his Patronus and not really a peacock. However, JK said no to that, but she also said Dumbledore was gay, so... Yeah, yeah, nah. We're not going to take whatever she says. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so, we start the story... Um, with Narcissa having an arranged marriage. Yes, because Andy had found her soulmate and obviously her soulmate was Ted Tonks. Yes. And had decided to run off with him. So in order to um, stop any more disgrace to the Black family, they'd arranged a marriage for Narcissa with Thorfinn Rowell. Which is a very important moment to consider later on in the story. Yes. I did get up to that point. <laughs> so, yeah, they were just wanting to save face, basically. There's a lot of, like, oh, I love you, I love you too. They discover that they're soulmates, that's a whole thing. And it was all very well written, and I'm very... Yeah, I was surprised that I managed to find a good Lucissa fan fiction that was relatively PG. Yes, absolutely. Yes, hundred percent. Because the the yeah, it's it's none of it's PG. So, um, I've obviously skipped past all of the the lovey dovey stuff, and I've gone straight to very cute astro astronomy tower proposal, and it that is was, adorable. That was adorable. So basically, for context, guys, um, Narcissa is um forced to have this. Well, is going to be forced to have this arranged marriage, but then her and Lucius figure out that they're soulmates. It, it happens very quickly. It does, it does, which is probably why I've not written much in between. But I do believe that if you, if you have discovered that your soulmate is who they are, you would kind of move things along quickly, especially if, because they were friends before that, so the, they did have a relationship prior. If they were going to be together for life anyway, you might as well just go for it. Like, what's the point in waiting? Mm -hmm. So then, um, obviously skipped a lot of, moments lots of chapters that were just inherently just soppiness um which is very cute for a little while and then i got bored of it um but we've got i've written in capital letters bellatrix throws shade at lucius <laughs> and then in quotes i've written are you growing yours out it's at that awkward stage where i can't tell in ref in reference to his hair yes and we all know lucius is i well i reckon lucius is very proud of his hair Right, so we've got a moment later about his hair. Oh. So yeah, Serafina and Abraxas were soulmates, and we see that because um, Serafina has a peacock on her arm, which matches Abraxas's Patronus. Yes, yes we do. Which again begs the question, was Abraxas bad or good? He was a Death Eater. He was a Death Eater, believed in blood purity, but he was probably also brought up that way. Hmm. There is the moment in the fan fiction where Lucius and Narcissa are dancing alone in the ballroom and Abraxas conjures up a um orchestra. Yes. Or for the instruments to play by themselves. Um and he looks very happy to see that his son has found his soulmate. So I think somewhat he's he's um he's a I mean he's he's a bad person for being a Death Eater, but he still wants the best for his son. Yeah, in this world at least, yeah. Yeah. So then we find out that um, Cygnus has been um, abusive to his daughters. Yes, he's used the Cruciatus curse on them. As punishment, yeah. Um, so Lucius asks Narcissa about this, having it, having had it mentioned to him. 
by um, Abraxas. Yeah. And then they 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 have sex for the first time. This this is like thirty chapters in. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I've got written. I've got a quote written, and it's the first. Other than the Bellatrix throws shade moment, it's one of the one of the only quotes that I've got written from the fan fiction, um, and it is when Lucius decides that he needs Narcissa to know that she's loved because obviously she hasn't felt it in her life yet, and he says, "I'd like to kiss you all over, if you don't mind. I believe you should be shown the degree of affection you deserve," and that to me is absolute lucius yeah that is that is i think i remember reading that and that's just one of the cutest moments in the book he, he it shows he respects narcissa mm -hmm. which we both know that he definitely does absolutely and i think it just it it read as something lucius would say in a pompous i'm gonna go over the top with this moment but the meaning is there yes definitely i i love that moment and I think it's a good way of showing that even though Lucius is a Death Eater, he's not essentially a bad person. No. So, they strip each other off, and then to quote Mamma Mia, dot, dot, dot. Yeah, we don't actually go into anything. No, because this is a, a teen fiction, um, so there's no explicit content. Yeah. There was like, they described the kissing, but it didn't actually go into detail of what he did. Of no. where he was, apart from the toes, and I was like, I didn't need all that information. <laughs> I was like, I'm not a huge toe fan myself. So. <laughs> no, toes don't do it for me. Um, so then they wake up the next morning. Everything's lovely. Um, oh no, it's not the next morning. They, they've woken up. They've they've had some time in bed. Um, when they get up, Narcissa starts getting ready. Um, she puts her blouse on and this was another moment that just screamed Lucissa at me and he fastened her blouse for her. Ever the gentleman. Ever the gentleman. He's like, I've just deflowered you. Let um, me let me dress you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make sure you look pristine. Well, so not, yeah, because I can imagine if that was, fa if that was found out that they um, did what they did. Um, before marriage. Well, we'll get on to that. Oh, is that? Oh, okay. Yes. I haven't, so if this is something that I haven't read yet. Yeah. So, Narcissa reveals to Abraxas and Serafina what actually has been happening at home because Lucius is like, couldn't you stay with us for a bit? Like, preferably forever because, you know, I don't want to go home. Um, so she tells them that they were using the Cruciatus curse um, and Abraxas takes Narcissa and Lucius to the ministry so that they can have Narcissa emancipated. It was a lot. That was a lot. That was a lot. I, I do remember reading this now. I was like, this is very intense for this. Again, it, it's completely different because it is the case of they know that they're each other's soulmate. Yes. However, in, in any normal situation, that's a lot to be like oh yeah come over and then spend the rest of your life here now is yes. a very big jump it's like zero to a hundred yes um so then they go back everything's happy they have some more sex but dot 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 um and the dark lord shows up at malfoy manor and lucius is like right stay here go to your room don't leave i'm gonna go down and deal with this don't know what's gonna happen um obviously narcissa doesn't listen in true Narcissa fashion. So she follows him down and stands at the door. Obviously, Voldemort knows straight away that she's there with his, his master legilimency skills, which made me think about the, um, the fan theory that Narcissa must have been an absolute master oculumens. Yeah. Towards the end of the, the, the franchise anyway, um, and that makes me wonder whether or not if something like that happened so early on in the relationship, whether or not she decided that that was why she needed to make sure that she was yeah. unable to be penetrated. Mm hmm. Definitely. 100%. Like, I think maybe that was the catalyst of her being like, I need to... Book like, me ideas up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I need to, uh, 
get on the get on this Oglomancy game because we're no Bella. When we definitely know Bella was um, a very skilled Legilimens. That's how you say it. Because mm-hmm. that was in the books, I'm sure. Um, and she actually Bella was the one to teach Draco, but nothing was said about Narcissa until the fan theory started coming up because she basically lied to the Dark Lord's face. Yeah. She had to have had some decent skill in in oc- like in oculomancy to yeah. have blocked the Dark Lord. Did Snape teach her? Well, there is that theory as well, isn't there? We'll get on to that in a bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Dark Lord basically wants to test Lucius's loyalty um, and says, you're going to perform the Cruciatus Curse on a loved one in front of a loved one. Now that he knows that Narcissa is there. So Lucius doesn't want to do it, um, but he performs the Cruciatus Curse on Abraxas in front of Narcissa and Seraphina. Yeah. And we must mention that Abraxas at this point is basically un- fucking close to death. Yeah, he's got dragon pox. Didn't mention that one. Yeah, he's got dragon pox. So um, he's, he's on death's door at this point. Um, Lucius cries while he's doing it, but still does it. And Lucius is very upset with Narcissa for breaking her promise and, and leaving her room to see what was happening. She was never going to just sit back and... Oh, no. Like before, Narcissa's a daddy. She doesn't get told what to do. So then they, they, they decide the next day because Lucius needs cheering up because he feels terrible about performing the Cruciatus curse on his father that um, Narcissa's going to take him to Hogsmeade. And when I say Narcissa's going to take him to Hogsmeade, I mean Narcissa says, we're going to Hogsmeade and Lucius buys everything. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds about right. Sounds about right. But I haven't read this bit yet, so this is, so this is all going to be barren from now on telling yeah. the story. So they go to Honeydukes and they buy all of the chocolate frogs and the chocolate cauldrons and the sour slugs and birdie bots and... and um... Is this like a, is this like a, um, a moment... F- that's similar to Harry when he's like, well, take the lot, and then selfishly takes everything off the trolley. Well, no, no, it's more like a, you can have whatever you want, my sweet, like, <laughs> oh. sickening stuff. But it was it was cute anyway. And she, she goes, oh, well, I've got this wonderful skill where I can tell exactly what flavour bean I'm picking up. So I'm going to have to show you that skill later. And it was just a bit much for me, but... We'll get on to that. So they're in they're in Hogsmeade. Um as Narcissa's is like, Oh, let's go into the alley where you first kissed me. So they stand in this alley very close together. It's very cold, it's raining, it's been snowing a little bit. And who should walk up the street but Druella? <gasps> oh no <laughs> Wait for it. With Thomas Rowell. So um, I did read up until this point. It is discovered that Druella's soulmate is Thomas Rowell, who is Thorfinn's um, dad. But during school, Druella and Thomas had a big argument. Thomas decided to go with someone else. So that left Druella without a soulmate. Yes. But now they're having an affair. This is all getting so juicy. (laughs) So obviously they, they discover this and they decide to apparate home because it's uh, it's it's a lot for them. So they get home, they discuss the Cruciatus moment with Abraxas because they hadn't spoken to them since the previous night. And he says that he's proud of him and that he's, he's um, really happy that he, he proved himself to the Dark Lord because, you know, he's going to have to take his place when he goes. Next morning, Abraxas is dead. Stunning. Yeah, so he's died of dragon pox. Seraphina's in a mess, obviously. Oh, they didn't even, he didn't even make it to the ball. No, he didn't. Oh, they were going to have a ball to celebrate the engagement. It's all going to be a huge affair. So, obviously, Lucius is trying to stay strong for his mother, but he can't because he's just absolutely devastated because he, he really wanted to tell him that morning that he, he really loved him and that he, like, it was a case of he really wished he'd spent more time with him growing up and... And now he never had the chance. Yeah. So whilst they're waiting for all of the the family guests to arrive, because obviously word has been sent that Abraxas is dead, 
um, they go upstairs and they have a shower together. But it's a very sweet shower together and they, they soap each other up and it's lovely. It's sensual without being sexual. Okay, okay. I can, I can deal with that. That's, that's cute. So they get out and here is, here's, the, here's my huge capital letters moment. Um, so they get out and they've, they've gotten dried and they've uh, put clothes on and they've realised that they need to do their hairs. So Lucia sits Narcissa down and plaits her hair. And that's why I love how Lucius knows how to plait hair. Yeah, he said he, he learned from his mother. So he plaits her hair and puts in um, one of his ribbons, his grey ribbons, because it matches her grey dress. Um, and then she plaits his hair. It's all very sweet. Aww, how sweet. <laughs> and puts how in sweet. her navy blue ribbon. So Lucius is wearing his father's robes. Um, along with a, a, a beautifully tailored suit and some Malfoy crest cufflinks. I feel like my immortal right now, describing exactly what he's wearing. <laughs> I wore a black dress with a dark black corset <laughs> and, and a mildly black lipstick. <laughs> so all of that happens there's like family around um his cousin avalon's about and he reveals that he was really close to his cousin avalon and it was lovely um and they decide that they're going to go to the pub later on to to have some food and, and a drink and and chill out um get out of the house for a bit so they go to the pub and who should be there but electo carol and um thorfinn Raoul. Oh, bearing in mind at this point, these two are enemies, shall we say. They drugged Narcissa. Narcissa was drugged with Amortentia. Amortentia, yeah. Um, But it was someone touched the potion before she drank it, so it basically enhanced her feelings for Lucius instead of going to Raoul. But, yeah. Not very nice people. No, no, not at all. So Lucius says, right, come outside. We're talking about this outside. You know, like a good British bloke would. (laughs) <laughs> and the ladies sit in the pub and they're all happy and talking and they're like oh everything's fine living living the best life and then they're like right okay it might be time to go we'll see what they're doing outside they go outside and lucius is lying on the snow face all bloodied not breathing what what <laughs> what oh my god so avalon apparates them to the manor and Narcissa and Lenore take the flu, crying on each other. Um, so Serafina heals them with amazing gifts. Like she's got this incredible healer gift thing going on. Do we think that Serafina may have worked in St. Mungo's? Possibly. And it's possibly where the whole fan theory of um, healer Draco comes from. Yeah, there is a theory about that. There is a, a lovely TikToker as well who does he So it. serious. I live. Um, so, yes, all of that happens. Lucius is fine because, you know, she's a fantastic healer. Um, and they go up to bed. So, because he's had some potions and stuff from the, the, the healing, he's got a bit of a funny tummy. So... Narcissa agrees to go and get some peppermint tea. So she goes downstairs to get some peppermint tea and finds that Serafina has been throwing up. And she's like, oh, would you like me to bring you some tea as well? And she was like, oh, that would be lovely. It's fantastic. So she brings the tea um, and she goes, is there something else wrong with you? Or is it just all of the stress of right now? And Serafina goes, I'm pregnant. I knew that was coming. (laughs) <laughs> I knew that was coming as soon as it was like is something else wrong with you mm-hmm. with Abraxas yes Ah, very is she old is she, is she too old to have a baby how old is she at this point well I don't think in wizarding years I don't think so okay fair enough because they, they live longer don't they yeah oh um, true so Seraphina's like don't tell Lucius well I'll tell him in the morning so she's like, uh, right, okay, whatevs. So they go to bed, everything's fine. They get up in the next morning, they have breakfast and Serafina goes, yeah, okay, pregnant. And Lucius cries and is, is very emotional and hugs her. This took a wild turn from just being a really sweet Lucius story to being like, I'm pregnant. 
Yeah, yeah. You're going to have a brother or sister, Lucius. It's a lot. And then there's a lot of lovey-dovey sentimental stuff that I just completely went, you know, you know what, I'm not going to read this. So I skimmed until the second last chapter. <laughs> okay. Where there's some sort of altercation and Lucius kills Cygnus Black. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Bella thinks that Andromeda killed Cygnus because she sees um, the, the flash and thinks it's come from Andromeda, but it hasn't, it's come from Lucius. Oh, Andromeda was there. Andromeda was there. Uh, Bella attacks Andromeda. Oh no. The fic finishes with Andromeda in hospital. Right. Ted being very cold to Narcissa because he feels like she's caused all of this because um, she's married, or she is marrying a Death Eater. Brilliant. Andromeda hasn't lost the baby. Everything's fine. I was going to say, I was, yeah, Andromeda is pregnant at this time. Yeah, she'd lost a lot of blood, but everything was okay. But he says, Narcissa, I think you need to leave. Oh, no, that's... So she leaves. She leaves the hospital ward, um, walks straight into Serafina and Lucius. And she says, look, we need to go. And they don't understand, but they, they respect it. And they leave with her. And the whole thing finishes with, um, as long as I've got you and we can get married before we go back to school, everything's fine. Great. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh, so do you, is that is so? Do you think the fic is over with, or is, is this author continuing to write it? Because I did not check any date. I did, right. So this one finished in two thousand and eighteen. Was started in two thousand and fifteen. Oh, wow, okay, so that was a, a long time period. That's like three years. Yeah. So I don't know. I haven't looked at the other the other fix that the author has. I can look, though, actually. I have my iPad handy. She has, I'm assuming she, they have... No, it doesn't look like they've got a continuation at all. Oh, interesting, okay. But it looks like they write... Lots of uh, Lucissa. Lots of Lu lots of Lucissa. Oh, does oh that's cute. Okay, I might check them out then. Yeah, a little bit of Severus in there and some Hermione Draco. Not a fan. No, but mostly Lucissa, which is nice because not a lot of people write it. <laughs> and she seems like a good writer. They seem like a good writer. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely, especially for fanfiction.net. Yeah, where it's. I usually find, so whenever it's your fan fiction night, I go and search fan fiction because I know it's bad. Yeah. So yeah, that was the fan fiction. That's cute, although I don't really agree with it, if it ends like that because there's obviously that fan theory going around that Narcissa and Andromeda kept in contact. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously that's shown throughout the fan fiction. However... I don't think it just ended if it, for example, if Bella was to attack Andromeda. So let's talk about the random yes. fan theories that we've enjoyed. Yes, there is a, so all these theories will include um, Lucissa or the Malfoy family or the Black family in some way, but mostly Lucissa. Yes. So your wife found a really, really good one. Mm. Which we've taken on to be as canon. <laughs> Absolutely. It just yeah. makes so much sense. The fan theory is that Lucius and Narcissa uh, struggled to conceive. We go into detail with that in that um, they are a great deal older than Lily and James, yet their son is the same age as Harry. Yes. yes. So... The theory suggests that they struggled to conceive for, for a very long time. Um, realistically, as pure bloods, they're going to want to have a large brood, aren't they? Because uh, they want to carry on the, the bloodline as, as well as they can. It's what's expected of them. Absolutely. However, they only have the one. They do. They only have one. Whereas if you look at the Weasleys, I mean, they weren't conceiving to carry on a bloodline, but like the Weasleys had a very big family. Yes. So, yes, the theory is that they, they struggle to conceive and 
when they did conceive, they showered Draco and spoiled him with, with love. Um, and that's why Draco is the way he is. Yeah, which is a very cute theory. It's, it's, it's sad. Mm-hmm. You think that they're so hopeful, this new couple, they get married and they're like, let's start a family or let's carry on the magical bloodline. And for like six years, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. And I think if, if, if that was a, if that was canon, I think that would be heartbreaking to see. Oh, 100%. Which leads us into, you sent me a, a very good one today, or was it yesterday, about Snape and Narcissa, with Snape oh, yes. being Draco's... Book. Right, so, this was another fan theory that I found. Um, I think I found it on hpfantheories.tumblr. Or no, it wasn't. It was live journal. Live journal. So, this theory suggested that on the 31st of October 1981, uh, Narcissa was waiting impatiently for Lucius to return from, from his mission. And when he did return, she was very relieved, but then he explained what had happened. And then she was like, oh shit, that was Lily. I'm going to have. Oh shit. Oh shit. I'm going to have to go and deal with Severus now. So. She, because um, Draco was only a couple of months old and he's been stirring all night because she's been anxious, um, she takes him with her whilst Lucius showers. So they go to they go to Spinner's End and Spinner's End it is isn't it yeah it is yeah I think so and she lets himself in l- lets herself into his home with Draco in tow. Like she she comforts him and he's he's sitting crying in his chair. Because, you know, Lily's gone, the love of his life is gone. Um, and then he kind of, his eyes wander over Draco a moment. And she's like, oh yeah, you've been so busy that you haven't fully met Draco yet. So would would you like to hold him? And, and he's like, I would really like to hold him. So then, like, in the best state voice, obviously, clearly. Of course. So she, she hands Draco over. For a moment, he feels a lot of happiness. And that's when she says, Severus, would you like to be Draco's godfather? And he's like, me? Of course I will. I will protect Draco with my life. And he does. And he does. As we see in the films, he does. He literally makes an unbreakable vow to protect Draco. Absolutely. I think that's such a sweet theory. Snape has had such a heartbreak in life. But also when you think about it, the Patronus fan fiction kind of ties in with Snape's story because Snape's Patronus matched Lily's. Absolutely. Did it match Lily's or was it Lily's? It was a... It was a... Um, a door, wasn't it? It was. But was it Lily's Patronus? Or did his... Patronus just suddenly decide to take on the form of hers. I'm just going to Google this one second. <laughs> this is no. This has just always been something I've wondered whether or not. Oh, it's a doe. Yeah. Yeah. No, nope, it's um, Severus is also a doe. No, no, no. But what I mean is, <laughs> was his Patronus something else, and it became a doe, or right. Did his Patronus disappear and her doe come to him? Oh, that's interesting. That's never been explored before. No, I've always wondered. Because it says here, it's, it's got a list of... So I've got a list of all the characters' mm-hmm. Patronuses. Um, James is a stag. Yep. Matches Lily's. It does. Luna's is a hare. Remus, surprisingly enough, a wolf. Oh, surprise, then... surprise. That was creative, JK. Well done. Yeah. Uh, but it does say it just says Severus is, is a doe doesn't give us any explanation whether it was different before well we, yeah. will, we will be doing a, a Severus Snape episode coming up so um, we'll have to do some research into that one and guess what Minerva McGonagall's Patronus is wow is it a cat? is this a good bee? wow yeah points for Slytherin <laughs> Dumbledore's is a phoenix as well of course there we go well done JK Good one. The creativity snapped, sis. Aye, which also kind of leads us on to a Draco theory. Mm. Now, this is wonderful. It's 
it's not. It's terrible. But there is a website called Draco Malfoy is a werewolf dot com. I like their dedication to this cause. They bought a domain for this. They paid yes. money for this name. Absolutely. So the website reads in between the fifth and sixth books directly after Lucius Malfoy has failed to retrieve the prophecy Voldemort allows Fenrir Grey back to bite his son. So this goes on to explain this. So it says Draco is not a death eater. At the beginning of the sixth book when Harry is hiding in Borgen and Burke's Draco threatens Borgen and shows him something on his arm. Harry thinks the thing on his arm is a dark mark but we never see it. Except we do at the end, but... We do, yeah. Harry always immediately assumes things and they turn out to be false. That's, that's also true. That's <laughs> very true. Another reason Draco doesn't have a dark mark is that at the end of the sixth book, there's a barrier to the astronomy tower that you can only pass through if you have a dark mark. This barrier goes up immediately after Draco goes into the tower and comes down just before he closes down. I'm not sure I followed that one. Okay. Additionally, Draco was never treated as a Death Eater. Okay, so what is he? It goes on. One ongoing arc in the sixth book is that Draco is sickly and stressed out. This is supposedly because of his quest, but Rowling does not does this misdirection a lot. Fenrir Greyback is introduced as a character who specifically punishes people who've messed up by biting their children. Remus Lupin is explicitly mentioned as an example of this. Why set this up if this is not to use later? That's a fair point. Okay, yeah. Like, she would Yeah, okay, I can understand that you wouldn't just mention it and leave it at that. Relatedly, Lucius's demonstrated punishments do not seem severe enough for his transgressions. Um, at the end of the fifth book, by the standards we are supposed to expect from Voldemort by this point in the series, it is also important to keep in mind that Lucius also manhandled Riddle's diary, resulting in the destruction of one-seventh of Voldemort's soul. It is likely that Lucius' additional punishment was unspeakably terrible. Voldemort says, maybe you can babysit the cubs to Draco when the Death Eaters find out that Remus and Tonks are having a baby. This is not a, th- this is a throwaway if he's not a werewolf. Again, yeah, I can, yeah, I can, I can understand. The, yeah, there's points there that make it believable. Yes. For us, the nail in the coffin is that while showing Borgen the mark on his, the mark on his arm, not the Mergen, the mark... <laughs> That's a whole different ball game, Baron. <laughs> the mark on his arm. Draco says that Fenrir Greyback is a, per- a close personal friend and he'd hate for him to have to pay a visit. Oh. Yeah. If the thing in Dra- on Draco's arm in Borgen and Burke's was not a dark mark, what else could it have possibly... Sh- what else could he have possibly shown to Borgen to make him so frightened? Finally, Rowling said in an interview that in one scene in the third movie, there was a moment that foreshadowed something she knew was coming and gave her chills. In that movie, Draco impersonates a werewolf and does a wolf howl. This also works for the arc of the flipping of the Malfoy family, who take care of themselves instead of following Voldemort. It makes more sense for them to throw away decades of servitude if one of them has been turned into a half-blood, making them ideologically incompatible with Voldemort's pure blood regime. That's interesting. Yeah. So, why hide it? There is precedent for JK to reveal only the tip of an iceberg in some of her characterizations. Well, we know this, don't we? Yes, <clears throat> absolutely. For example, Rowling was going to write a whole arc about Dean Thomas's family, but instead she chose to focus on Neville. Additionally, Dumbledore's love of Grindelwald is never addressed during any of the books, but was only revealed by JK during question and answer after all the books had been published. There are likely many other elements of the story that have been left behind uh, for one reason or another. It may be entirely possible that Draco's reveal was planned for the seventh book, but, for example, got cut for pages. Rowling has new content being released by book, and this could and could be saving this to reveal it on Pottermore or for the seventh book. Um, however, we know, I think this is... Um, Oh, it makes Draco's relationship with Snape even more interesting if Draco was relying on him for Wolfsbane. Ah, that's awesome. Yeah, especially if um, Snape is Draco's godfather. Mm. So I think what we need to remember now is that JK has said no. (laughs) JK's like, didn't happen. Nah, it's fine. After all of this, JK said no. 
Um, but there is a website. You can go and have a look at that website. I've literally read the entire website out to you. There is nothing more than that. So We'll link it below, though, just in Yes, case. yes. Please feel free to peruse Draco Malfoy is a werewolf.com. It's not very well set out. It's literally just all text. But enjoy. Yes. Enjoy yes. this theory. But there's also... so the, Speaking on the, the topic of Snape, we... There is also the theory that Narcissa has possibly had a relationship with Snape in the past. Mm. Um, Because obviously we know that Snape was in love with Lily. But Snape couldn't have gone his entire life without having some form of connection with someone else. So the Snape and Narcissa Narcissa theory is that Narcissa seemed comfortable in conversation with Snape. So in the books, when she goes to Spinner's End with Bella to uh, talk to Snape about Draco's task that has been set by the Dark Lord, Narcissa seemed comfortable in conversation with him and knew where Snape lives, which is something that all Death Eaters know. It's because Bella marked that surprise. She knew how to get in the magical way. She knew a way around the house. Again, this could be, like, friendly stuff. However, Baron and I have a lovely theory. Yes. That, um, this is alternate universe, because we do know that Snape was younger than them. However, um, Narcissa fully went and had a relationship with Snape if he was a teacher. So, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Completely AU, but yes. Children don't do this. This This is highly illegal. But, um... She fully went and did that because, like, yeah, she wanted good grades, right? Right, she did. (laughs) (laughs) But, yeah, I do believe that there was some form of relationship going on between Narcissa and Snape. That could have been between the timeline of Lucius going to Azkaban and coming out of Azkaban. Absolutely, and I don't think Lucius would would, um, look down on her for that either. Yeah, because, again, we have a lovely theory that uh the Malfoys were polyamorous yes the Malfoys were swingers big style (laughs) absolutely like there is no way that you can you can look at them two and be like they were just with each other and them alone like nah I just feel like Lucius is a bit too flamboyant and also Narcissa's a bi icon there's also a theory about her dating Marlene McKinnon Yes, I read that as well. I like that theory. I like yeah. that theory. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call that theory as um something that is canon. <laughs> yes, Narcissa is a bicon. She is a bicon. Yeah. So when Draco comes out as gay, Narcissa's just like, here's a pride flag. Here's a pride flag. Yas cake. Yas cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think yeah, I think very much. You can't look at the the Malfoys and not think. Yeah, there's something going on behind closed doors there. They've got money. They've got this huge, big house just to themselves. No, of course, they like to entertain. Of course, they like to entertain. And what do they do when they entertain? They have massive orgies, essentially. Yeah. With all of the... with uh, So unlikely kind of people will go to these parties. But these parties are secret kept, so no one... like It's an inner circle, mainly, but... You've got the likes of, like, Remus Lupin, who goes to that party just for the crack, you know? Yeah, no one talks about it afterwards. It's fine. What happens at a Malfoy party stays at the Malfoy party. Absolutely. One's in the bowl. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah. (laughs) That is one of my favourite lines, I think, from any of the series that we've done so far on TikTok. 100%. One's in the bowl. One's in the bowl, guys. (laughs) But, yeah, I, I fully believe that Narcissa and Snape had some form of relationship, but that does that doesn't exclude Lucius. Like I feel Lucius got involved in this action at some point. Oh, absolutely, hundred percent. I don't think he was straight in the slightest. Oh, definitely not. <laughs> I reckon they were both pansexual. To be fair, I think it doesn't even matter in the wizarding world. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I think they are more concerned about blood purity than they are about sexuality. Mm. Because if you, so I have this wild theory, which probably isn't true at all, but uh, Dolores Umbridge, when she creates all these rules, 
She's like, boys and girls must not have permitted to be within eight inches of each other. And I'm like, Dolores Umbridge is an ally. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Okay, you win. (laughs) That's my theory. (laughs) Wow. Okay. (laughs) So you have also a Black Sisters... I do, I do. So, um, I was reading up on this on Tumblr, and I don't think any of these theories are going to be linked below, by the way, because there's just so much everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. However, so the Black Sisters uh, are, or tie in with, the tale of the three brothers. So, you've got Bella. She's, um, her main concern is power. She's after power. And, like, the person with the elder wand or they get killed Mm -hmm. she gets killed in like a pursuit of power she gets killed by molly weasley um andy is after love um so like the stone she is is desperate for this this love and and being loved at all times and is gets it at the cost of death and destruction Mm-hmm. So Tonks dies. We know that. That's a, that's a consequence of um, what she's done and destruction. She was disowned from her family. Yeah. Um, Sissa wants anonymity within the Death Eaters and wants to protect her family. Cause, so kind of like the cloak, the invisibility cloak. Yeah. Okay. She. They all survive. Her and her family all survive the end of the story hmm, that's quite a yeah. nice interesting one i like that it is, it is very good isn't it i was reading it and I, I was like oh okay that makes sense that does make sense whether jk Rowling wanted to is it made that a, a thing unintentionally or not well i think throughout history there's the, there's stories of um the power of three isn't there yeah there is yeah i think it's a very recognizable trope throughout all history and mythology um so i think that would make sense three seems to be a powerful number when it comes to stuff like this as well three is a magic number (laughs) so final no not final but second to last ridiculous fan theory is that the malfoys are part vila i can get behind this one when I was reading about it, I was like, oh, okay, this makes a lot of sense. Yes. So we, we talk about, um, presumably there must be male Vila. Fleur is only part Vila and the Vila genes seem to dominate in our family. Therefore, in order to be any pure Vila's, there must be male Vila's. Yes. The, yeah. That's, it's never said. Like, not, uh, Vila have already been sort of more on the female side, but... but yeah. To have the Vila line go on, the, the must be male Vila's. Unless they reproduce asexually. But then why would they marry wizards? Um, so assuming they're based on the Slavic Vila, which were believed to be spirits of frivolous women stuck in some kind of purgatory, which is not useful in terms of working out for reproduction. But Draco, Bill and Fleur... No, back to Draco, sorry. Bill and Fleur... <laughs> That would have been an interesting one. (laughs) Bill and Fleur have one son, um, so it's possible for a male to be part Vila. But the whole Draco as part Vila storyline seems to mostly come from various fan fictions. JK has said nothing to suggest that there are Vila blood in Malfoy's. Um, It would probably be problematic for several reasons, because pure blood families are interconnected and it would most certainly mean that there were Vila blood in every other pure blood family, because, you know, the Malfoys are very incestuous. Of course. Well, I think at at some point throughout history, the, the pure bloods are all related to each other in some way. So, basically what we're saying is that it's absolute bollocks. Theories that I'm like, okay, this fits, but it's so far fetched. Yeah. That I'm like, mm. so th- one of the theories that was 
I read about where it was like so the whole crux destruction and the prophecy the failure so Voldemort has done worse to people for doing less yeah but somehow Lucius managed to get away with it like a magical emancipation on Lucius's part because we all know that Vila's are kind of like the sirens but with legs yeah and they dance instead of sing and obviously Fleur had that little like somewhat yeah ego I'm not gonna say ego like how would you say it I think um, ego works a demeanor a demeanor yes that's yeah. yeah she had kind of that effect on people and then I think people have noted that towards Lucius because he's a very charming man mm -hmm. um he he's very high up in the ministry before he went to Azkaban however it's a lot of bollocks <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But on to my final load of bollocks, but absolutely perfect theory. So mm -hmm. this doesn't fit necessarily fully with the Malfoys or anything, but I just need to mention it because it made me laugh so much. Okay. So the Malfoys were looking for a nanny um, <laughs> when Draco was a child. Oh, no. <laughs> and they went through loads of nannies. They couldn't find one that worked. Um, until they found a wonderful nanny with a magical bag <laughs> and an umbrella that had a wand in it, just like Hagrid's. Oh, I know where this is going. And that nanny was called Mary Poppins. Good old Mary Poppins can even cross over universes. Yes, she can fly. She, yeah, she has a, a bag that has like, obviously some sort of um, shrinking charm in it. She has a best friend who's a squib so he understands um that she's that she's a witch but he, yeah. he can't be part of it but he tries his hardest because he really wants to be a wizard <laughs> it's this bird um and she went to hogwarts under mcgonagall and dumbledore and, and learned all of her best things <laughs> from them <laughs> i love this theory <laughs> And she's really good at transfiguration. That's that's what that's what she does. And I think you see that in the Mary Poppins films. Of course, yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, Mary Poppins was Draco's nanny. Brilliant, <laughs> canon. That's it. That's that's done. <laughs> what Hogwarts house would you say Mary Poppins was in? I'd say she was a Gryffindor. Oh, would you? I, yeah, I would say either Gryffindor or Ravenclaw. Yeah, and she's quite courageous. She is. She is. She does stand up to Mr. Banks. She does, absolutely. Um, but then also the whole, I think, I feel like a feminist would probably be a Ravenclaw as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's why J.K. Rowling isn't a Ravenclaw. Um, <laughs> I have one more. It's not really a theory, but more of a situation, which is hilarious. Um so, obviously, um, Andromeda and Sirius went to school together. Mm hmm So, if, if Wolfstar was a thing, mm -hmm. Sirius introduced Remus to Andromeda. And Andromeda was like, cool, if you break my cousin's heart, you'll have me to deal with. Years down the line, Tonks comes home with Remus and goes, Okay, meet my new boyfriend. Can you imagine Andromeda's face? I mean, I hadn't even thought about that. Right? <laughs> and we and, and and people people slam the snarry fix, but really, in reality, like that's weird. When you think about it, like Andromeda's cousin to Andromeda's child. Yeah. <laughs> All the shippers are going to come for us tonight uh, oh, when they when they are. listen to this. These comment sections gonna be wild. Anyway, yeah, I've so coming back to it, I think we should mention the fact that we do not we we do make a Harry Potter podcast, but we do not condone what JK Rowling has been saying. Not at all. Yeah. We've already discussed this on our TikToks, but we are aware we might reach a larger audience doing a podcast. Trans rights are human rights. JK yeah. is trash. 
we have mentioned her a couple of times in this podcast, but that is only necessary for the stuff that she wrote. Uh, she may have created this world, but she didn't make it, hence why we have created this podcast all based around fan things. So fan films, fan fictions, fan theories. Yes, because it's the fans who make this world, absolutely. It's it's still okay to love it. Like, as Daniel Radcliffe said, don't let what she said tarnish what has been created. And if you are going to buy the merch, Belle, from smaller businesses, not the official store, let's boycott JK Rowling. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and also, um, there's also, come back to a fan theory, there's this fan theory that Rita Skeeter wrote the books. <laughs> I read that Dobby wrote them. <laughs> oh, I've heard Minerva wrote them and then handed them to JK and went, just put this under your name, you'll make lots of money. I mean, yeah. But also Rita Skeeter was, didn't she, when she was outed as a liar, didn't she go and live in the muggle world? Yes, she did. So I reckon Rita Skeeter wrote the books. Absolutely. I think that's that should be canon now. <laughs> that is canon. Yeah, definitely. 100%. <laughs> so I think we've reached the end we have. Yes, of our first ever Drag Malfoy podcast. Yay! Look at us being all successful networkers. <laughs> we'll see if it works yet. Hopefully. So, our next episode, I'm not going to say when it's going to be because we don't know when this one's going to air yet. Yeah. But In two weeks' time. Ish. So our next episode um, is going to be on Voldemort. Ooh. So we're going to talk everything Voldemort, Voldemort fan fictions, Voldemort fan theory, Voldemort fan film. And there is a lot of Voldemort fan fiction out there. Oh, there really is. You've written one. Oh, there is. Yes, I, I have written my own. Yes. I think we should talk about Baron's fan fiction. <laughs> what do you think, guys? I think we, I think we should. I mean, yeah, if you, if you want to hear about my Voldemort fan fiction, please comment below and say if, if that's what you want to hear or if, if you know of a really good, um, moderately PG Voldemort-based fan fiction, please leave a link below as well and we will check them out. Yes, definitely. We are always up to um, suggestions. Um, also, side note, we are fans of the show we didn't create, so if we have got any information wrong about this, then we do apologise. Um, we are also drinking while we record these, so it's probably not good. No. So don't come for our kids, because, like, we're both yeah. old enough and should know better, but we don't, so... Anyway. <laughs> On that note... Thank you for listening to the Drag Malfoy podcast. We will be back in about two weeks' time with the next episode. Thanks, guys, for listening, if you have listened this far. <laughs> this is probably going to take me a while to edit, and I am excited. I'm actually excited to edit it, to be fair. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be sat there for a while, but I'll just be like, yeah, it's cool. But yeah. Thank you guys for tuning in. We will see you in about two weeks or so. Bye. Bye.